Hello and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager. On the 8th of September, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II sadly died at the age of 96, plunging the country and the world into a new era. For most of us, she was the only monarch we've ever known. She's been a constant since before many of our parents were even born. For this week's Weekend Essay podcast, the Money Marketing team looks at how the financial landscape changed during Queen Elizabeth's reign. On the 6th of February 1952, at the age of just 25, Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, became Queen upon the death of her father, George VI. Her coronation wasn't until the following year, in June. Now bear with me because I've written my section of this weekend essay based entirely upon internet research and talking to my parents, as I myself obviously wasn't born yet. At the time Queen Elizabeth ascended the throne, people were still reeling from the effects of World War II, which had ended just seven years prior. Rationing was still in force, although some items had started to become derationed. Meat was the last item to be derationed in 1954, ending rationing altogether. The economy had suffered in preceding years. It had lost huge amounts of absolute wealth after having been focused entirely upon helping the war effort, and it took some time for it to be reorganised for peacetime. It had, however, fared better than those of many other European countries. As many readers will remember, in the 1950s and 60s, money looked very different from how it does today. It was made up of three units of currency, the penny, the shilling and the pound. There were 12 pence in every shilling and 20 shillings in every pound, meaning there were 240 pence in every pound. Apparently, the reason for this was that in the early days of the coinage system, money was based on the weight of precious metals. A penny was literally one penny weight of silver. To make up a pound in weight, you needed 240 silver coins, and so it became standard that one pound in currency was 240 pennies. These currencies were used in the UK until the 15th of February 1971, and my dad remembers when this changed. He says the change was taught in schools, but people found getting their heads around the new decimal system, as in 100 pence in every pound, very confusing at first. Employment was high in the 1950s, meaning serious labour shortages in industries such as manufacturing and transport, and this led to mass immigration from Commonwealth countries to fill the gap. In 1957, then Tory Prime Minister Harold Macmillan made the famous statement, people have never had it so good, referring to the improved living standards of the time. As for inflation, CPI inflation was at 11.2% during the Queen's accession in February 1952, even higher than it is today. In the 1950s, it was the Korean War which sent commodity prices spiralling. Cut to the 60s and UK inflation was relatively benign helped by low global inflation, but towards the end of of the decade it started to rise again. Efforts to keep the pound strong ultimately failed, and in November 1967 the government was forced to devalue the pound, cutting it 14% from $2.80 to $2.40. This pushed up prices because it made imports a lot more expensive. Devaluation was considered a political embarrassment, but many felt it was necessary given declining competitiveness. The Prime Minister at the time, Harold Wilson, made a major announcement telling people, Our decision to devalue attacks our problem at the root, and that is why the international monetary community rallied round. In the early 1970s, economic growth accelerated, and in the 1972 budget, then-Chancellor Anthony Barber made large tax cuts but his so-called dash for growth was unsuccessful. It caused inflation to rise steeply and sparked a real recession in 1974, which led to falling living standards from rising prices. This ultimately led to the defeat of former Prime Minister Edward Heath and his replacement by Margaret Thatcher. Oil had become an intrinsic part of the economy and many people had taken for granted the fact they could buy it so cheaply. This meant that in the 1960s and the early 70s, more and more people began to own cars. But in 1973, the Organisation of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries proclaimed an oil embargo on nations it perceived to be supporting Israel during the Yom Kippur War. This sparked an oil crisis which caused the price of petrol to more than double. So the UK faced an energy crisis at the same time as a spike in inflation. The government put the country on a three-day week 
and it imposed a curfew on TV, which was turned off at 10.30pm every night. It even introduced emergency speed limits to try and help conserve petrol. It seems some things never change. In 1977, the Queen celebrated her Silver Jubilee, marking 25 years on the throne. Now over to you, Mamadou. Thanks, Louis. On 4th May 1979, the Queen welcomed her eighth and first female Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. The Thatcher years ushered in the age of market deregulation, tax cuts, trade union reforms, and privatization. Many state owned industries and utilities were privatized. All factories and coal mines were closed. Manufacturing in England and Wales declined. Unemployment rose sharply to a level not seen in Britain since the Great Depression. This economic turmoil was made worse by a severe global recession triggered by the Iranian revolution in 1979, which disrupted the global oil supply. The energy crisis that followed pushed UK inflation to new double-digit highs. Readers can see similar parallels with the current energy crisis caused by events in Ukraine. Mark Twain once famously said, History does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. In 1979, exchange controls in operation since the Second World War were abolished. This led to the pound falling to its lowest level against the dollar. The 70s economic wars continued in the 80s. However, Britain was treated to a fairy tale royal wedding in 1981 when Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer tied the knots at St. Paul's Cathedral. The wedding of the century, as it was called, was broadcast in 74 countries and watched by 750 million people around the world. By the time Thatcher won re election in 1983, Inflation had fallen to 3.7%. Thatcher's economic programs were almost derailed by the miners' strike of 1984, which many observers describe as the most bitter industrial dispute in British history. Privatization of nationalized industries increased shared ownership in Britain, and a quarter of the adult population owned shares by 1989. Parliament passed the Financial Services Act in 1986 to regulate the financial services industry. A Securities and Investment Board, SIB, was created to preside over various new self-regulating organizations. John Major succeeded Thatcher in November 1990, becoming the Queen's ninth Prime Minister. The 1990s started with another global recession. Britain's economy shrank by a total of 6% as the unemployment rate increased. Black Wednesday, or the 1992 Stalin crisis, damaged the reputation of the major-led conservative government. The UK government was forced to withdraw Stalin from the European exchange rate mechanism. Tony Blair won the Labour Party leadership election, succeeding John Smith, who had died suddenly. In May 1997, Labour led by Tony Blair won the general election after 18 years of conservative government. He became the Queen's 10th Prime Minister. Blair ran on a platform of new Labour, a marriage of new liberal economic policies and strong welfare states. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, gave the Bank of England the freedom to control monetary policy which until then had been directed by the government. In 2000, Parliament passed the Financial Services Market Act, replacing the Financial Services Act of 1986. The new act created the Financial Services Authority, the precursor to the Financial Conduct Authority, the Prudential Regulation Authority, and the Financial Ombudsman Service. According to experts, during Blair's 10 years in office, there were 40 successive quarters of economic growth lasting until the financial crisis in 2008. In 2002, the Queen celebrated her Golden Jubilee, marking the 50th anniversary of her accession to the throne on 6 February 1952. It was intended by the Queen 
to be both a commemoration of our 50 years as monarch and an opportunity for her to thank her people for their loyalty. Despite the deaths of her sister, Princess Margaret and mother, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother in February and March 2002 respectively, the Jubilee was marked with large-scale events in the UK and the Commonwealth realms. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Mormadu. The years in the run-up to the Queen's Diamond Jubilee can be seen as a decade when there was a fundamental shift in financial services. The turbulence seen in foreign affairs unleashed by 9-11 took a while to be matched in the domestic economy. It could be argued there was a time lag of nearly a decade. The economy appeared resilient with growth rates consistently between 1.6 and 3% from 2000 to, two to early 2008. Inflation held steady at around 2% in the run-up to the financial crisis, with the Bank of England's control of interest rates lauded over this period. A long period of economic growth and stable prices pretty much ended with Tony Blair leaving office in 2007. His successor, Gordon Brown, was soon faced with the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. The UK's prestigious financial services sector suddenly looked exposed to a crash rooted in the US housing market. The British economy was particularly vulnerable to the crisis because its financial sector was highly leveraged. Firms that were household names soon needed government bailouts, beginning with Northern Rock that was taken into public ownership in February 2008. The Royal Bank of Scotland was nationalised in October, and other financial institutions also needed support. Unemployment rose from 1.6 million in January 2008 to 2.5 million by October 2009. In March of that year, the Bank of England announced it would pump 200 billion of new capital into the economy through quantitative easing to support it. The process saw the Bank of England creating new money that it used to purchase assets such as government bonds, bank loans and mortgages. The action Gordon Brown took was not enough to secure him a general election victory in 2010. A coalition government consisting of the Conservatives, led by David Cameron, and the Lib Dems, headed by Nick Clegg, was formed. This government prioritised controlling the budget deficit and repairing the public finances that involved tough public spending cuts. The policies proved controversial, and some accused the government of making ideologically driven choices. The atmosphere led to the plans for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee being restrained due to the public mood. During February 2012, a senior advisor was quoted as saying the Queen set two guidelines for the planning for Jubilee. These were the use of public funds should be minimised and people should not be forced to celebrate. Over the summer, London hosted the Olympic Games. JB, you're up. Thanks, Michael. In the period after Diamond Jubilee, the Queen met three Prime Ministers following David Cameron's resignation. Theresa May was the first one, followed by Boris Johnson, and finally Liz Truss. She also witnessed major regulatory transformation in the financial services space, some of which was induced by geopolitical changes. One year after Diamond Jubilee, Queen Elizabeth II gave royal assent to the Financial Services Act 2012, which put an end to the Financial Services Authority. The new regulatory framework came into force on 1st April 2013 and is still effective up to these days. It includes the Financial Conduct Authority, the Prudential Regulation Authority, and the Financial Policy Committee. As part of this act, the Bank of England received responsibility for financial stability. In 2014, the European Parliament approved an updated version of the Markets and Financial Instrument Directive, known as MIFID. The introduction of MIFID II and the accompanying regulation, EU number, uh, number 600, 2014. MIFID II essentially deals with market infrastructure, transaction reporting, product governance, investor production, and rules of inducements. The FCA was tasked with implementing MyFit2 in the UK. The next major event was in 2016 with the Brexit referendum, which led to the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. As a result, the UK started a process of onshoring or adapting legislations inherited from the EU to give firms time to adapt to the new requirements, 
and avoid disruption. Once Brexit became effective, the UK lost its passporting rights in the European Economic Area. Passporting enables financial service firms from an European Economic Area state to do business in another European Economic Area state without requiring further authorization from that country. The UK and European Union could agree on new terms post Brexit to facilitate continuation of business for UK financial services firms in the European Economic Area. Some UK firms are establishing subsidiaries abroad to ensure passporting remains uninterrupted. This is also true for EEA based firms with business operations in the UK. The Queen also witnessed the spread of the COVID-19 virus and its ramification both within and outside the financial services industry. As the UK began to recover from the COVID pandemic, it experienced its highest level of inflation in 40 years amid soaring fuel and food prices. The consumer duty was the last major piece of legislation in the financial services industry that took place during the Elizabethan age. The FCA published its final consumer duty guidance for firms on 31st July 2022. It will require firms to act in good faith and to ensure their value for money. One of Queen Elizabeth II's last political encounters was a recently appointed UK Prime Minister's list trust whose move in 10 Downing Street with significant challenges ahead amid a difficult macroeconomic climate. So much has happened in the past 70 years. The financial landscape has changed a great deal, although as shown, some things never change. Now the baton passes to King Charles III, the oldest person ever to assume the British throne at the age of 73. It is unlikely he will spend quite as long in the post as his mother, although there are apparently people born today who will live to 150. But at the rate things are moving, who knows how much will have changed by the time the next monarch is crowned. Thank you for listening to our weekend essay podcast this week. We do hope that you enjoyed. Please do keep up to date with all our new releases via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you get your podcast from. You can also keep up to date with all our new content published on the Money Marketing website, as well as our print edition, Money Marketing Magazine. So make sure to subscribe. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. See you next time.